Thank you for joining us. I'm here against my will. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. Hi everyone, welcome back to Candid Coffee. I have a very special interview today, episode actually. I'm treating it more like a documentary. I wanted to give my side of the story for Podorithic Laboratory Specialties, which is our family company. It's run by my dad, Hambi Kamurian, and my brother, Constantine. And we have a location for the manufacturing company out in Canoga Park, and another one, a clinic in Armenia called Kamurian Podiatry Clinic, located on Comitas 44. It's a very near and dear uh, episode for me because I want to tell it from my perspective. And we'll start from the beginning. So my dad was born on May 23rd, 1963, and when my grandmother went into labor, everyone in the Vartashen neighborhood where they were living in knew that there was a boy to be born soon. He was he is the middle child, he has an older brother and a younger sister, and someone in the neighborhood took it upon themselves to come over and say, oh, your son is being born on the day of ascension, Hambartsman Ora. So they said, you have to name him Hambartsum. And it was kind of a bold statement coming from just a neighbor and my grandparents really didn't have a choice in what they were going to name their son. But till this day, I can't imagine him having another name and it's very fitting. Um, he always, you know, rises to the occasion and he rises above a lot of adversities and, and um, problems that he's had throughout his career. So um, they were growing up. It was my aunt and uncle, my grandparents, my grandparents, uh, my grandfather's brothers, their wives, and grandparents all in one house. So it was about seven children and three couples and grandparents. And needless to say, it was extremely crowded at the time growing up in this small house with so many people, but it was really wonderful for him because he was surrounded by his cousins and his siblings and lots of children in the neighborhood. I remember my grandmother saying how fun and active and adventurous he was at, uh, at an early age. And um, another thing that was very evident was um, my grandmother was a homemaker and my grandfather worked in construction and he also worked um, as a waiter after an injury that had happened to him. And they, they, took it, they took a lot of pride in making sure that their children were very well-spoken, well-dressed, and um, my grandmother would sew their clothes and it would be perfectly pressed and nice and um, very, very well put together. So she took a lot of pride in doing that for her children at a very early age and it kind of just kept going and he's always been very very well dressed and well put together till this day. So my grandmother would always tell stories of how uh, my father's upbringing was and his childhood and things like that and I'm very close to him and my aunt and they would always mention how my grandparents would always take the time to read to their children and the, the, there was always someone in the house that was reading and it just became a part of his life to read literature and, and things like that. Aside from just going to school, um, he didn't have a higher education as far as college goes, but um, it was something that he really enjoyed doing and it really showed because he's a very well-spoken person, he's very articulate, and he's, um, he's very uh, knowledgeable about a lot of random things. So um, he did go to a trade school a little bit after high school and it was in Russia. It was like a it was like a electronical mechanical trade school that he went to and uh, he went for a few months. He came back home. It was supposed to be like a learning experience, possibly a, a career venture at the time. And my grandfather asked him, he said, you know, and he said, so if anything, that he learned from any of that. He didn't pursue a career there, but he did learn how to work better and work smarter. And um, that was really evident as well uh, throughout his career. 
um, because he was always very resourceful and he was always trying to think of innovative ways to further his career and, you know, one means to an end and then another. My father and my mother were friends for many, many years through high, through high school. They had a very long courtship and they were very admirable, um, you know, for people who were looking at them from the outside, uh, especially on many occasions, both my grandmother and my aunt had mentioned how loving they were towards each other, how considerate and um, kind and, and just the, the, the bond between them was, was so evident. In fact, uh, on a few occasions, unbeknownst to him, my aunt had gone into his room when he was still living at home with you know, his parents and uh, took out his journal and she saw that he had written many poems and little diaries about, uh, diary entries about the relationship between my mom and him. And it was really awesome to see that because my, my aunt would read that kind of behind his back, but it was also very sweet to see the, the affection that he showed her um, and the feelings that he wrote down in that diary. And she had told me that many, many times. And then later on, he found out about it. And my grandmother also had mentioned how much she was, you know, how proud she was of him for, for having such a, a great relationship with my mom. And they had a pretty long courtship. Um, there was a point where he had to go serve in the military as any man does around that age in Armenia till this day. Um, there's, you know, uh, two years that you have to go and serve. And he had ac actually asked her to wait and, and to be patient while he goes and does his service and comes back. And sure enough, she did. And um, very quickly after that, they had started planning the wedding and, and um, they got married in 85 and I was born in 86. About four years later, my brother was born and the year that he was born was exceptionally important because the whole family, which included my grandparents, my aunt, my parents, and my brother and I, so seven people, all of us decided that we were going to come to the States together as a family. And that happened in 91. And we had had this wonderful, beautiful uh, baptism ceremony for my brother, where pretty much it was like a big goodbye party. And all of our relatives in Armenia knew that we were going to be coming to the United States. And it was such an exciting and probably scary time for everyone. Um, just the fear of the unknown and coming here and, you know, starting a new life and starting from zero. And I feel like that was a lot of pressure, not just on uh, my dad, but also on my grandpa and my grandma. And we were all kind of putting in this team effort to support each other. We were getting on our feet, just, you know, barely like getting by in the beginning we were living in a small apartment and <clears throat> my grandmother would take care of me and my brother and my mom would as well and then on the side my dad and my uh, boppy were working and it was just this big group effort to take care of one another to be there to support each other emotionally financially whatever it may be and it was a very tight bond and we lived together for quite some time and um, during the first few years that we were in America, my father took up a job working at a um, liquor store and he would work during the graveyard shifts there. And he was working, you know, six to seven days out of the week um, at night when we were home and we were missing him and he was missing us. And it was, it was kind of taking a toll on, you know, I'm sure the relationship with my mom and, and being away from us. But of course, he saw it back then as a means to an end, a way of, you know, just working, putting food on the table, a roof over our heads, and then coming up with the next best thing. And always keeping his mind open to new opportunities and new business ventures. So um, a little bit after that, we had got, we had moved into a house um, out of the apartment and we were renting a house out in North Hollywood. And we had, um, gotten into the sewing business through a, a friend who had recommended it and the whole family was sewing buttons onto shirts and dresses and other clothes and we did that for many many years uh together um, and until one day he had this 
idea come into his head and think th thinking that this would be a really amazing opportunity, um, something that would be very long term that you could build upon. And that was, you know, making orthotics, shoes, braces, anything for the lower extremities and treating patients who have uh, uh, problems with their feet and with walking or they have injuries and things like that. So that's where PLS had just, that, that seed was planted. Um, right around 96, 97 is when we really got that ball rolling and started a very small factory, which eventually grew into what it is in Chatsworth right now. <laughs> So after over a decade of ongoing success, everything was going really well with PLS and the manufacturing company we have in Canoga Park. I know that he wanted to do something more, something that was bigger and would would have a greater positive effect on his people. And he decided to open up a clinic in, in Yerevan. That was especially important to him and it was very near and dear to his heart because he knew that technological advancements in Armenia when it comes to uh, um, orthotics, shoes, braces, and things like that, even prosthetics or just durable medical equipment, any kind of thing like that is not really that advanced. People don't know that you can have these corrective braces to fix any kind of um, problems that you may, have, may be having with walking and um, just correcting any kind of issues that you may have with your feet. And he knew that, he knew that there was um, very little help for people that are suffering from things like this and they don't even really recognize it or know the severity of it. So he really wanted to help his people and opening up a clinic was so important to him and he wanted that to flourish. And sometimes people will come in and they don't know anything about it. And you know, the nurses and the staff there will educate these people and they're so happy and they're so relieved that this kind of service is available now there that wasn't so easily obtained before. And it was just really ignorance about it. And um, it's so awesome to see that after six years, it's still running really well. It's helping a lot of people. It's educating them about their health. And I know that's um, very gratifying for him and our family in general. Hi, I'm Constantine. I'm the CEO of Pedorthic Lab Specialties. We are the leading manufacturer of orthotic devices in the United States, um, more specifically uh, foot orthoses, so like custom uh, diabetic insoles, custom foot orthotics for sports or injury or custom ankle braces. We're located in Southern California, Canoga Park, uh, you know, to be exact. We have 40 employees. Um, we're still growing, um, you know, I'm hoping around this time, maybe next year, we'll be at 60 employees. We manufacture about 300 plus orders a day, uh, so 1,500 orders uh, a week. And a lot of those are, you know, are multiple pairs of uh, insoles. So we're looking at anywhere from uh, 3,000 to 4,000 pairs of orthotic devices a week that we do ship out to our customers nationwide. So from California all the way to Florida, uh, as north as you know Washington, D.C., 
Uh, we have customers all throughout the U.S. As CEO, I'm in charge of making sure the company runs uh, in a particular way. I make, um, I'm also in charge of just general uh, design as I'm a certified pedorthist, so I'm in charge of the actual quality of the products that go out. Anytime that a doctor may have any specific questions regarding a specific order or a specific situation their patient might be in, uh, you know, I'll, I'm always there to provide my expertise. Um, I also, um, I do IT, I, you know, sometimes I'll be the janitor, so, you know, I do a, a large plethora of things. Typically, the way a uh, order would begin was, uh, would be that the patient would either go to their MD uh, or, you know, their uh, primary physician and would either complain, hey, I, I have foot pain or if, it's, if he's diabetic, hey, I have an ulcer or, you know, I'm a diabetic and I need a... Uh, some corrective or accommodating insult. At that point, the, M, uh, the lead physician or primary physician would uh, refer them out to either a podiatrist and the podiatrist would treat them or possibly uh, the podiatrist would then refer them out to an OMP facility or, or it's possible the primary physician will just directly refer them out to an OMP facility directly. That is all, you know, it can go a lot of different ways. Um, as to how the patient ends up uh, at a uh, OMP facility or a, even a medical supply in some cases, but uh, primarily an OMP facility. So at that point, the orthotist or the podorthist would see the patient, will take a look at the prescription and take a mold of sorts. So either you would do a biofoam box, um, that's almost like the, you know, in the, if you get a floral arrangement and inside is that, it's like that green sponge. It's kind of like that. Um, except it's a little different grade, so that's a biofoam box. Or they would do a plaster cast where uh, they would uh, lift the patient's foot up and wrap plaster around it, and that's called suspension casting, or they can even do a weight-bearing mold of that. And that takes a lot more time, and depending on the severity of the foot or how and maybe it's deformed, they might do that. But for the, most of the time, you're, you, know, you, you can get away with doing a biofoam box. Um, it isn't as intimate, but it gets the job done. Uh, and then you can, you know, nowadays, if the doctor's comfortable, there's scanning technology. So you can actually using an iPad scanner and it's what is called a structure sensor and it attaches directly onto the iPad. Um, you can actually scan the patient's foot directly. And then instead of packaging that box up and sending it to us, you can use our software to just directly send that over to us. And that will cut down on lead time. And then also uh, it will prevent possible damage to the phone box, either going through UPS or FedEx or USPS. That sometimes occurs. Now, as far as uh, what happens then, we'll get that order. The order entry team will process it. If there's any questions, we'll relay that back to the doctor and then um, we'll get that situated and then we'll begin the fabrication. Then depending on what we're making, we'll look at the foot, we'll import the scan in. If it's a foam box, we'll still have to scan it in and digitize it and uh, input it into our design software. And then we'll start to design the insole or the foot orthotic around that foot. And then um, typically, depending if it's a functional foot orthotic, uh, uh, we would use a, a wooden or plastic foot positive and uh, pull, plas uh, pull hot plastic over it. Or if, it, if it's for a diabetic and it requires more of a foam type of uh, insole, high density foam, we would use our CNC's to direct mill it out. Now in cases, if they're ordering like an ankle brace, we actually get their foot, we correct it. If it isn't already corrected, the cast. And, um, and in those cases, it's a full on fiberglass or a plaster cast and they take a uh, the mold of the full foot and the leg as well depending on what type of device they're ordering. But we'll grab that, we'll modify the foot, and then we actually mill out the foot itself. And then we'll build the ankle brace on top of that. Um, after we're done milling out the wooden positive or the insole, we'll finish the product and then we sh we'll ship it directly to the doctor. We don't really ship directly to the patient, just for the fact that it needs to be fit by a professional. So you, you, know, you can't just send over a a prescription product and have the patient, you know, just put it in their shoe and everything else. There still needs to have a little bit of a tweaking in there on the dispensing side. 
What's unique about PLS, I mean, versus some of our other competitors is uh, we're always a, innovating. Not to say they aren't, but we're one of the only companies, uh, even right now, to uh, manufacture a pair of extra depth shoes uh, with every ankle brace. So what happens is uh, patients who, for instance, break their leg or uh, fuse their ankles or anything like that require an ankle brace. Now that ankle brace isn't going to fit inside a Nike or a regular type of a shoe. And typically the shoes they would need is, is an extra depth accommodating shoe. And those are usually given for free by uh, Medicare or insurance companies for diabetics. Now it doesn't necessarily mean that this person who needs an ankle brace is diabetic so they do not have access to these shoes. And these shoes cost you know, anywhere from 100 to $200 retail. So what we do is with every ankle brace, we provide a pair of extra depth shoes to ensure proper fitment. And what we did is we invested over $350,000. We have our own uh, injection molding machine to, make these, to help make these shoes. It's the same system that Adidas uses. Obviously we use our own molds, but um, it's just these type of things that we do to kind of help make a 360 degree a treatment plan for this patient so they don't give them a ankle brace and then say oh well good luck you know and this patient can't put this into their existing shoes and they don't necessarily have two hundred dollars or hundred fifty dollars to go to the store the extra depth shoe store accommodating shoe store and grab a shoe and then what happens is they don't wear the ankle brace their foot deteriorates and it leads to an amputation this year uh, we actually fully revamped the way we do our orthotics and we do our insoles. We uh, are ceasing to manufacture our old way. We are now overhauling our whole system to FitFoot 360. We, you know, we spent around, uh, I think around $50,000 in just totally reworking our system j just a couple months ago. Uh, and our old system wasn't broken, but it was kind of outdated and we figured it would be a good time, especially uh, now with the COVID-19 pandemic, we took advantage of uh, the downtime and we completely retooled our whole lab. So where our orthotics used to take five to eight business days to manufacture, now we get them out in 72 hours. Yeah, me and my father, it's a interesting dynamic. He's, you know, he obviously is an entrepreneur. I like to think of myself as an entrepreneur too. I have the clinical background as well as being a pedorthist. Um, he'll, for instance, try to He'll always kind of speed things up in a manufacturing sort of way. And I'll, you know, put it together and how to keep that, you know, how to kind of bring it to reality, you know, actually implement what he's thinking and then uh, make it actually worthwhile. So, and actually efficient. So it's kind of a, it's an interesting dynamic, obviously, just like every father and son duo or, you know, the relationship you butt heads, but uh, we, we get it done. So far, I think we're, going on 15 years and you know we haven't killed each other yet so like my brother said uh, they have about 30 people 40 people they're looking to expand more in the next you know five to ten years they're always looking for inno innovative ways to advance the business and I think it was his tenacity and his drive and his um, wanting to do better for himself and for his family, for his children and now grandchildren that he just always thrives to, to be the best that he can be. And I think that's very much um, transferred over to Constantine being, you know, working there so young and being him being the, the new backbone to that business and eventually possibly inheriting that business and knowing everything about it and it's you know because of my dad's discipline and you know the way that they work together and um, sometimes he's a little bit uh, difficult or a little harsh but I think it's made all the difference in a positive way uh, to bettering the company and also giving um, Constantine that confidence to know that he is doing the job right and he will continue to do that for years to come.